I feel like when I speak to you, I say on a regular basis that such and such passage was um, one of my favorites. This is actually one of my favorites, and you can know it was one of my favorites because we used it at our wedding uh, 14 plus years ago. Um, I, I love the ending of this passage. I think, I think most of us do. We identify it as a way of, um, of of God's love being expressed between human beings. Do not press me to leave you. It's just, it's glorious and beautiful. And I will say too that uh, as is true for many uh, couples who are about to get married, you don't fully understand all of the implications of what's present in these, in these, beautiful, uh, in these beautiful words. Your people will be my people. Sometimes you don't know exactly what you mean when you're saying your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die, there will I be buried is more of a commitment than most of us want to make, is it not? We start at the beginning, though. The beginning of the book of Ruth in these first few verses, things appear to be terrible, but they are worse than we might imagine. In the days when the judges ruled, that may seem innocuous enough to most of us, but in the Hebrew Bible, alarm bells are already ringing loudly. The book of Ruth hearkens immediately to the book of Judges, where nobody really ruled. Things were chaotic, violent, truly horrific. And then there was a famine in the land, almost None or none of us have actually dealt with true famine up close to the degree that actual starvation is on the line. The story continues. A certain man of Bethlehem in Judah. Bethlehem means house of bread. The house of bread is empty. And so they went to live in the country of Moab. And now in the ears of an Israelite audience, the word Moab rolls off the tongue uncomfortably. Genesis 19 says that Moab has incestuous beginnings. When the Israelites wander in the desert, Moab seeks to curse them. Eventually, Moabites and Israelites would wage war on each other repeatedly. The book of Deuteronomy bans Moabites and their descendants down to the 10th generation from entering the assembly of the Lord. Clearly the biblical text is constrained in many ways by its culture and its history. Nevertheless, the story continues. The name of the man was Elimelech. Elimelech means God is king. So these people, they go into the country of Moab, which is a place of hostility and previous cursing, and Elimelech, the one whose name means God is king, he dies. There is a critical theological point that is being made about the desperation of the situation. But not only that, not only does Elimelech die, which represents a whole new level of sadness, Naomi's sons take Moabite, Moabite wives now as they start their families. The clan that has cursed yours has been brought into your home. These early family meals might have been more than a little uncomfortable. Ruth and Orpah one might wonder what they had done to deserve this particular fate for themselves. And then their husbands die. Naomi's two sons are gone now, too. The first five verses are verses of such incredible sadness and deprivation. It is a scene where we might, in our more reflective moments, wonder what happened to God? Where is God in this? The book of Judges, the book to which this narrative is tied right at the beginning, begins a series of downward cycles throughout the book that are introduced by the statement, and again Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And as the story continues to unfold, God features less and less, and as the evil of the people increases and they commit increasingly immoral acts, by the time the story reaches its horrific conclusion, God is not in the story anymore. You realize that it has been several chapters since you ever heard anything about God. There is divine silence, complete and utter 
divine silence, a complete absence of hope and morality and virtue. Can you imagine that? A world not where you and I might have our doubts, not where we might be agnostic, but at the end of the book of Judges and at the beginning of the book of Ruth, things are so thoroughly hopeless that a man whose name means God is king is dead. We recently went to Thailand, as we said at the beginning. On our first afternoon, we went to a city named Kanchanaburi, the place perhaps most famous for the bridge that crosses over the River Kwai. And on that first afternoon, we went to uh, the cemetery for Allied prisoners of war who had died building the Burma Railway during World War II. You may find it strange with two elementary school age or age children that our first stop on our first afternoon in Thailand on our first day of our big summer vacation, even before we checked into our hotel with a nice swimming pool and let the children play there, that we would go to a cemetery first. But not only was I determined to see the cemetery in the adjacent museum, more importantly, I was lost. And I didn't want to tell my family I was lost. So I saw the cemetery and the museum and said, oh, here we are, just what I was looking for. <laughs> Folks, maybe I was jet lagged, but I was undone. Nearly 7,000 small headstones, well kept of Australian, Dutch, and British soldiers which does not include the tens of thousands of Indian, Thai, Malay, and Burmese civilians forced into construction work to build this railway that was not much more than 100 miles long and which, when it was completed, was bombed and destroyed by the Allies. A man named Ernest Gordon, some of you will know Ernest Gordon, uh, he wrote a book in the early 1960s called Through the Valley of the Kwai which was his story of being a prisoner of war and being forced to work in a labor camp helping the Japanese build the Burma Railway across Thailand. He was captured in 1942 and he begins his book by, having, by saying that he once had a dream while he was in the camp. A hopeful dream, a dream of freshly ironed bedsheets. We've all surely been camping at some point and come home to clean sheets and we know the wonder, the simple, beautiful wonder of clean bed sheets. The wonder of resting and knowing you're not doing anything but resting, but you're really home now. Ernest Gordon, he saw the bed sheets, he felt them, he could smell them, he saw the flicker of warm shadows from the fireplace from back home in Scotland, only to emerge from his sleep because of the smell around him, the smell in the jungle, what he called the corrupt smells of dying things. As he slept in the death house where prisoners of war lay around him in sackcloth, a medical orderly approached him after he had just woken up. They chit-chatted for a few minutes, and the orderly said, my only ambition in life is to die of old age. How you see the narratives of Orpah and Ruth unfolding are undoubtedly dependent upon your upbringing, your context, your hopes, and your dreams. There is nothing prescriptive in the way that the stories of the two daughters-in-law are told. Their actions are just described. And often, Ruth is held up as the hero, and Orpah, for returning home, is held up as an example of a woman who didn't roar, who didn't fight, who didn't stand up when it was time to be counted like Ruth did, which is awfully unfair. How you see the story can be misused, certainly, in the hands of the wrong people. Ruth's de devotion to Naomi was so complete that church male authority figures over the years have used this text, especially in cultures where obedience is important to say, oh, Orpah was obedient, and that's good, but Ruth was slavish in her obedience to another, and so that's even better. Sacrifice is good, but complete and utter self-sacrifice is best. You can see how problematic that might become. Nevertheless, do not press me to leave you, 
In verse 18, our reading for the day concludes, And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. You can take that in two ways. That Naomi was so moved by Ruth's determination that she stopped pleading with her, or she found Ruth to be so stubborn and difficult that she quit talking to her. Whether Naomi found Ruth to be wonderfully devoted, a wonderfully devoted companion that she did not deserve, or a difficult, headstrong, stubborn woman that refused to do as she was told, or all of those things wrapped up into one, many of us see this passage and feel that it still is of God. Do not press me to leave you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And it begs an important question, doesn't it? Why does this kind of devotion, why does this kind of love, which is in the Hebrew Bible called hesed or loving kindness, it is intentionally one word because love and kindness are brought together in action. Why does this kind of devotion to another come about in human beings who are under great strain and stress? and less so when peace and abundance dominate our lives. How can that be, even when we know it to be true? In Ernest Gordon's Prisoner of War Camp, he describes the study of theology, economics, politics, and languages flourishing as the men worked on the railroad and as they ate their one ball of rice each day and as they lay in preparation for a fitful sleep. They shared with one another the classics, and they learned Russian and Greek and Mandarin and Italian precisely because it was a way of sharing gifts generously with their neighbors. What can we teach each other? How can we help each other grow in this place? As Gordon himself said, it was faith, our faith, that enabled us to transcend our environment and prepare us to make decisions on matters of ultimate consequence. The quest for meaning and the quest for religious search and the hunger for all knowledge went hand in hand. At one point, the officers of the company at the camp received a tiny amount of financial compensation from their captors for helping to build the railroad. The officers gathered together to determine what they would do with their small amounts of money, and arguments broke out. Big arguments broke out among them. Officers saying the chips were down and they have to try and save themselves because no one else is going to take care of them. That they were free to take care of their own needs in such a situation because other ethics and morality were now out of the window. And ultimately it was decided that they were still officers in charge of their men and their men were in terrible shape and therefore they had to share what they had with everyone at the camp. And that decision, basic as it might seem to us, changed lives and saved lives because it changed the entire trajectory of their time as prisoners. Gordon claims that that act of generosity proved to be contagious. For a coin or two, men could buy an egg or some bananas from their captors at an exorbitant profit. But a small amount of nutrition could be the difference between life and death. A detachment arriving from another camp would be surprised to find small gifts of food given to them upon arrival. The ethic of generosity spilled over, becoming the dominant ethic of the camp for those who were building the railway. As Gordon said, it was dawning on us all that the law of the jungle is not the law for humanity. We had seen that for ourselves and how quickly it could strip us of our humanity. Death was still with us, no doubt about that but we were being slowly freed from its destructive grip. Selfishness, jealousy, and greed were all anti-life. Love, self-sacrifice, and creative faith were the essence of life, turning mere existence into living in its truest sense. Here is a man on the edge of starvation and death with people dying of tropical diseases and dysentery all around him, and he is talking about living in its truest sense. What is it about a famine that would prompt Ruth to follow Naomi with such vigor, courage, and faith? Now, if you know me, you know that I'm not thoroughly opposed 
to taking selfies. It's, it's fine, no problem. A way to mark where you were and who you were with. Showing people these pictures of ourselves is modern social currency that is embedded in a series of ritual transactions that I'm sure many cognitive psychologists have done or are about to do studies on, but it is foundational to the way people live today. But at that cemetery with those 7,000 prisoners of war laying buried, there were people posing for pictures of themselves. And on the bridge over the River Kwai, which is a memorial for those tens of thousands who died help building that railroad, I was asked to take a picture for two women who managed to choreograph the perfect pose at the perfect moment in the perfect light of themselves smiling. At Wat Pho, in the temple of the golden reclining Buddha, people jostled with each other to get a picture of themselves alone in front of this object of devotion. At another shrine, I noticed one woman, hands together in prayer, offering her reflections to a statue of the Buddha, while others looked upon her impatiently, feet tapping away because they wanted to get a picture of themselves in front of the statue and wished she would hurry up and move. On another day, I was in a taxi in the back of a pickup with my children. The two women shared the ride with us. One of the ladies was from Mumbai. I love being alive today in 2018, right? Sharing a taxi in Thailand with a woman from Mumbai. How great is that? She worked in an ashram after a career in finance. She did the books for the ashram. Within three minutes of getting to know each other, she was offering me quotes from her spiritual master, and I was comparing and contrasting stories from the New Testament as we shared the good news that the Spirit of God is in all of us and that the divine breath is here for one and all. And I recalled for a moment how good it is to be alive and just for a second perhaps not need to think about anything other than faith. Faith at the center of things, the essence of existence, the raw beauty of the day, the meaning of life, and it's most glorious and simple. That is that just for a moment, I forgot about things like taking my own picture or other people needing to take their own picture and just sat in the present trying to get my priorities straight for the 10,000th. May God's peace be with you all.